Our scripture reading this morning is Mark 13, th- 3, 13 through 19. And he went up on the mountain and summoned those who, whom he himself wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve so that they would be with him, and that he could send them out to preach, and to have authority, and to cast out the demons. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means son of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon, the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Good morning. I certainly appreciate your presence this morning. I appreciate the prayer on my behalf, and I also appreciate Dylan for the scripture reading. I actually intended to tell him how to pronounce Bonergis, and uh, he actually did a really good job. I forgot to even tell him how to do it, so nice job, Dylan. The, the lesson this morning is Lessons from the Sons of Thunder, and over time I've heard the name or the term the Sons of Thunder referring to James and John, and I never really knew what it meant specifically, Uh, but, you know, it just kind of seemed like it was coming up more and more often. Maybe I'd hear it at a podcast or something like that, and then I'd come across it and and Mark, and so I decided to look a little bit more into it, and I was kind of disappointed. It doesn't exactly say why they're called the Sons of Thunder. I was wanting like a, here's the explanation, run with it. Well, you kind of have to use your own inferences as you uh, study but um, we can find a, a, a few different things from different passages in the Bible, and we can kind of infer why Jesus named them the Sons of Thunder. Sorry, this is my first time using the PowerPoint. I don't know if I'm coordinated enough to go off of both things at once. We'll give her a shot here. Also, I apologize if it's too small. I wasn't exactly sure. So in Matthew 4, 21 through 22, and going on from thence, he saw the other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And then we have a parallel passage in Luke 5, 1 through 11. It's, it's much more descriptive. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Genesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, and, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then they had gotten into the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, your word, I, I will let down my net. And when he had got, done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled their partners on the boats to come and help them. And they came and filled the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell, fell down on Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were the partners with Simon and Jesus, said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for now you will catch catch men. So they brought their boats to land, and they forsook all and followed it. So a few things to take away from these passages is that James and John, they, they recognize the fact that the time to follow Jesus is now. The time, the time when they were called is the time that they left. They dropped everything in order to go and follow Jesus. And that didn't just mean follow him for the day. That didn't just follow, mean follow him for the week. That meant continually follow him to place to place as he preached and performed miracles. They were to drop everything, and they basically, well, dropped everything. 
They just took what they had and they followed Jesus. And that follow doesn't just mean literally follow them, but it means to emulate them, to act as Jesus. And so Jesus also uses this opportunity to tell them that in the future, they're not going to be fishing anymore for fish. They're going to be fishing for men. So their actions and their desires, their goal is going to be to proclaim Christ in order so that they may be able to bring in a catch of men to Christ's body. So they didn't have any excuses like we find in Luke 9, 57 through 62. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to them, foxes have holes and birds have, and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his head down to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And so these are just a couple of excuses that people that were in their heart or in their mind, they said, we want to follow you. But then when it came down to it, they weren't prepared. They weren't prepared to drop everything and go as, as James and John had been. And no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That, that indicates that once you commit to Christ, there, there's no turning back. You've got a straight line to follow and just keep on moving forward. If you turn back, then you begin to recognize the ways of the world and then you begin to fall away. In Luke 9, verses 51 through 55, we can see that a misguided, misguided zeal for Christ can be dangerous. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? And he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of, for the, man of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And then they went on to another village. And so I, I can kind of picture Jesus' reaction when they say, do you want us to command fire down to destroy them? If it were me, I'd just take a deep breath. <sighs> no, James, no, John, we're not going to destroy a whole village because they won't let us stay there. I think my kids by now know when they hear me take a deep breath, what do we do? But I, I don't necessarily think, and I actually don't think that Jesus needed that extra couple of seconds as he took a breath to contemplate what he was going to do, how he was going to address the situation properly. <clears throat> but um, I think in some ways we can, kind of, we can kind of relate to their reaction to James and John's reaction to the Samaritans. Um, you know, how, how dare they do this? This is the Son of God. He came to save them. And yet they're just rejecting him. They won't even let him spend the night there. And I guess a little bit of a, a backstory here. So the Samaritans and the Jews, if you're not familiar, they um, weren't exactly best buds. They, uh, the Jews tended to look down on Samaritans as inferior. Um, some say they, they considered them half-breeds because they would intermarry with other, with other groups. And um, so consequently, the Samaritans didn't think too highly of the Jews if they were being, um, if they were being treated poorly. And so this isn't exactly a surprise or shouldn't, shouldn't be a surprise to James and John that they were rejected from coming into the Samaritan village. They're going here to um, attend the Passover feast. And so there's a bit of urgency. They need to be there at a certain time. And so it's a, a bit more frustrating to them. But Jesus rebukes them and he says, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. Yeah, you are acting out of a spirit of anger. I'm sorry. They are acting out of a spirit of anger, and their attitudes or spirit were not right with Jesus' desires. His desire was for them to act out of love, compassion, and forgiveness. So, now that doesn't excuse the Samaritans. They were, they were guilty of the same sin of partiality as the Jews were guilty of. But at this moment, James and John should have acted in a more humble manner, humbled themselves, 
and for the sake of the souls of these Samaritans. So then Jesus goes on to rebuke them again, or continue to rebuke him. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And so Jesus knows God does not desire anyone to be lost. Ezekiel 18, verse 32 says, For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9 says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a great... I'm sorry. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but his long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that should all should come to repentance. So what we can gather here from Second Peter 3 is by Jesus sparing the city, by him restraining James and John, that he was actually buying the Samaritans more time. They, Jesus knew that they didn't know about Jesus at this point. This is, he's kind of new in his ministry, and this is something that we're not going to just destroy a whole city that doesn't even know about me. So this buys them more time. It gives them more time to come to repentance and to come to Christ. Mark 10, verses 35 through 45, we can find that greatness is found in serving. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us that we may sit, we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in glory. But Jesus said to them, Do not you know what you ask? Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink and be baptized in the baptism that I am baptized in. But to sit on my right hand and sit on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those to whom, we, whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. So, in the first part of this passage, we can see that James and John can be very prideful and show their arrogance. Um, it seems very arrogant to me to assume that they can just simply request a place on place of prominence at the right or the left hand of Christ. And I, I can't even imagine the audacity it would take to ask that. How would you have the courage to ask that, you know, to push yourself in that place? Like, wow, that's, that's pretty uh, brazen, but... <laughs> So think of the problems also that their arrogance caused, because it says when the disciples heard this, that they were greatly displeased. And I can imagine they're just sitting back like, well, what are we, chopped liver? You know, they're, they're on the same path as James and John, and they're following the same goal to follow Jesus and to, to convert people to Christ. And to hear them think that they could just put themselves above everyone else, I think it would kind of... Um, wouldn't sit very well with many of them. I mean, they're the ones that have just like tried to destroy a city because, you know, they wouldn't let them sleep there overnight. So it kind of, it, it doesn't really match very much with, um, with the, whole, the whole point of Christ and, and greatness. And so if we go on through verses 42 through, through 45, but Jesus called them to himself and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, for whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus kind of stops the squabble between them, and he explains to them spiritual greatness. So Jesus is essentially saying, what you know of as greatness on earth, just forget about it. Greatness in heaven is completely the opposite. So on earth, we think of people with positions of authority, kings, or maybe people that um, are very knowledgeable in certain areas. They have positions of, 
greatness. They considered greatness, and so others would serve them. But in the Lord's body, he says it's the opposite. It, maybe if you think of it as an uh, inverted pyramid to where the actual, the greatest is at the very bottom, and they're willing to serve everyone else. They're willing to humble themselves in service to everyone else. And this issue with greatness among the apostles actually comes up again in Luke chapter 22. And so we can see that it may not just be James and John who don't quite get the concept, but also the other, other apostles may still be struggling to, to grasp this. And I think in some ways it actually kind of shows the ambition of James and John. Now they, they didn't know exactly the right way to go about it. They didn't understand greatness in the Lord's body, but they, I believe they truly desired to be great in the Lord's number. And they just, they had a hard time of um, grasping that whole scenario. Now, something that I found interesting is this discussion of greatness comes directly after Jesus describes the pain and suffering he's about to endure in Mark 10, 32 through 34. So the passage directly in front of this. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid, and they took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. And... In parallel passages in Matthew and Luke, they also describe it in the same order. They describe Jesus predicting his death or prophesying his death, how it will happen, the pain and suffering that he will endure. And we know Jesus was, he was mentally aware of this his whole life. He knew this was coming and it's coming closer and closer to, to fruition. And so what makes it so odd is he's literally just telling them about this. And in the next passage, James and John say, Hey, can we sit on your right hand and your left hand in, in heaven? And it's almost like if you were telling me that you were about to die and you're describing the pain and suffering you're going through. And I said, oh, uh, can I have your car? It just, it just really shows, um, <laughs> it just shows a bit of, uh, well, it just shows a bit of their, um, their thunderous attitude. that They're thinking more of themselves at that time. Um, they were a bit impulsive. <clears throat> So as new followers of Christ, these sons of thunder could be harsh at times. They could be impulsive, uncompassionate, selfish, prideful, and inconsiderate, just to name a few. It is believed that John lived on into his 90s, and he was no stranger to suffer persecution. But as a result of a better understanding of Jesus through his life, he is now known as the Apostle of Love. In John's epistles, he mentions love approximately 107 times. James and John started off like many of us, rough around the edges. They were what I, and possibly you, would consider a work in progress. Each day they desired to be more and more like their mentor and savior. James was the first apostle to become a martyr, quite possibly because he still had some of those thunderous attributes from the beginning. We know he was imprisoned with the other Christians, yet he was the only one of them to be chosen to die. Jesus, or James was very likely telling them the truth, something they did not know what to hear. That same truth that James and John knew as eyewitnesses to Christ is the same truth that we know today. Without Jesus, we will die in our sins. As we mentioned at the beginning of our lesson, James and John knew the time to follow Christ was right then. In that very same way, the time for us to confess Christ is the very moment we realize that he is our risen Savior. Not the next day, not after we learn maybe a little bit more about the Old Testament or when our schedule frees up, right then. If it's right now, then now's the time. If it's at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm sure there'll be plenty of us to put our suit coats over top of our pajamas and come in here for baptism. We'd be glad to do it, but... We know we must hear the word in Romans 10, 17. We must also believe Acts 2, 37, 38 says we must repent of our past sins. 
Matthew 10, 32 and 33 says we, can, we must confess him. And then Mark 16, 16 was to be baptized in order to be saved. If any of these things apply to you and you're ready to confess Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is the time to come forward and make that known. If there's anything that you need to bring in front of the congregation, now is also that time as we come stand and sing.